Hello, listeners. Welcome to See How We Run Conversations with Arts and Cultural Workers. This is a special Below the Radar series hosted by Julia Augie, Kathy Fang, and Samantha Walters. See How We Run is a mini series looking at local arts collectives and organizations, highlighting conversations about creation, space making, accessibility, and self determination within the framework of Vancouver's cityscape. These episodes are recorded on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. On this episode of See How We Run, we're joined by two cultural workers, Asia Zhang and Vittoria Vito Montero. Asia is a curator and arts facilitator and was one of the co-organizers of Ground Floor Art Center, a collectively run gallery, studio, and project space with a focus on supporting early emerging artists. Vito is a visual artist and currently the acting curator of learning and engagement at the Contemporary Art Gallery. Together, we chat about some of their previous work and individual practices, creating opportunities for emerging artists and incorporating accessibility into the gallery, as well as the importance of centering care and joy in arts and cultural spaces. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, welcome back to Below the Radar. My name is Kathy Fang and I will be your host this week. I'm here with some very lovely people, Vito Montero and also Asia Zhang. And I guess I will start by doing a visual description of myself. The three of us are currently sitting in SFU Van City Office of Community Engagement's satellite office at 312 Main. I have headphones on, I have blue hair, I'm wearing a brown turtleneck and a black sweater, and I will pass it off to Vito, and maybe you can start by introducing yourself. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kathy. Really excited to be here. Um, Yeah, my name is Vito or Vittoria Monteiro. Happy to be sharing space with you both today. Woo! Um, For my visual description, I have um, wavy, short brown hair that's kind of bunched up into a black toque today. I'm wearing a black sweater with a white collar, very prepper school vibes. Uh, I have black pants on and I'm playing with a little fidget toy. I have a septum piercing and hazel eyes and sort of light olive skin. So that's me, Jack. And Asia. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me, Kathy. My name's Asia Jong. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm from a really small town called Armstrong in the interior of BC. My visual description of myself is um, I have brown eyes, black hair with blonde undertone. And I have uh, a white mock neck on currently and very long fingernails that I just got done for my birthday. And they're so beautiful. <laughs> I wish we could show you. <laughs> I can do this. Ooh, yes. That is ASMR. everything. <laughs> ASMR. Um, yeah. So maybe we could start with also just a general introduction of yourself and your practice. Um Because I brought you both together because you're both artists, cultural workers, facilitators. Uh, So, yeah, maybe again, Vito, we'll start with you. Mm. Um, Yeah, I realized I didn't say my pronouns. I don't think I did. But uh, my pronouns are they, them, and sometimes she, her. Um, About me, yeah, I'm, I'm an artist. I am a cultural worker. I just repeat what you say back. (laughs) That (laughs) is okay. (laughs) Um, I'm an artist, a culture worker. I work at the Contemporary Art Gallery currently as a curator of learning and engagement. I also am a facilitator. I'm a board member, recently board president of Grunt Gallery, which feels kind of ridiculous. (laughs) (laughs) Who let me do that? Um, So I was born in Brazil, Berlin do Pará. I was born at the uh, mouth of the Amazon River, which is uh, important and special to me. My family is from Recife, which is in the northeast of Brazil. Um, That's where everybody lives except for my mom. But I grew up in BC, in Victoria, going back to Brazil every uh, two years. And um, yeah, so I'm Brazilian and half Colombian as well. Um, Yeah, I mean, a little bit about my 
practice. I mean, I think a lot about accessible spaces, accessibility within the arts. Um, I think about how to make office culture and office spaces more joyful and rooted in play and um, nice things. I think it's hard to be a culture worker and it is a space that is mostly about sort of what's the word extraction <laughs> very extraction based and burnout is intense and um just thinking about more ways to lean into joy and play at work so i don't know um uh, whether that made sense but uh yeah i guess that's a little bit about me thank you um asia i'm really bad at talking about myself so i'm just gonna preface <laughs> that oh, yeah. um yeah I'm also a cultural worker an emerging curator and arts facilitator I have my own independent curatorial practice but I've also been part of an art collective called ground floor over the past years and I think something that I really prioritize is Similar to Vito, just thinking about playfulness and care. I think a huge part of my own practice and my practice as part of a collective has been like the the foundation being built on the idea of friendship. I think one of the only reasons why I do what I do and am involved with the arts is because I just have a craving for making connections with people and meeting new people and becoming friends with people. And art is an amazing way to facilitate that. Um, so I think that's like one of the foundations of why I'm interested in even doing any of the stuff that I do currently. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was a good answer. <laughs> it's a wonderful answer. Um, yeah, I think maybe that's a really great segue because I wanted to kind of go into talking about Ground Floor. Like you mentioned, it's an arts collective that you were a part of and you did a lot of work with. And I guess I wanted to ask you about the story, if you want to share about how it started and what inspired you to start working with them. Yeah, totally. So Ground Floor was a DIY arts collective um, based out of Vancouver. It was started and founded by um, artists Yasmin Heyboob, Jack Kenney, and India Elliott Oates, and then shortly joined by Carlin Savage Hughes and myself. Yeah, we operated a small gallery space in one of the abandoned shopping malls in Chinatown. Now it's not so abandoned, but at the time <laughs> we were one of the only people in the mall. And yeah, we, we had a space there from 2018 to 2020 and we ended up exhibiting over 125 artists, a lot of it in the form of exhibitions but also through workshops, concerts, festivals, performances, and sales. And it was also a space that we were able to provide for free for auditions, rehearsals, tutoring, fundraisers, and other sort of studio visits for um, early emerging art practitioners in Vancouver. So yeah, we, we sort of operated this space for about two years, and we were putting on exhibitions and events like two to three times a month. So it was like really intense. Um, <laughs> yeah, we did it all out of a labor of love. We were completely not funded by any um, grant money. Yeah, trying to do fundraisers, karaoke parties, anything to sort of make back some money for studio rent. But yeah, it was completely run out of our own volition and through like the support of artists and community members that were willing to participate and uh, be part of be part of like the ground floor community so it was like super super special mm -hmm. and yeah we really emphasized that um, ground floor was a place for and is foundationally for early emerging artists um, which we describe <laughs> as different from being an emerging artist because emerging artists has such a broad definition whether or not that's defined by like an institution or like the Canada Council or whatever an emerging artist I think can be that terminology is very daunting because you're either what an emerging artist or you're a mid-career artist. There's like no in between. Um, so for us, we were really thinking about how can we support early emerging artists, those that have never had opportunities before, artists that have just come out of school or maybe they maybe they went to art school 20 years ago and they want to explore their practice again. People that haven't had 
um, opportunity to get the resources that they've needed to sort of further expand their artistic practice. So yeah, that was um, really our priority for Ground Floor. Another thing that I just wanted to quickly mention too is that I think the reason why Ground Floor was um, really important for early emerging artists was because it was a space that you could fail in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that space isn't given to uh there isn't the opportunity to have that type of experimentation and to have as we describe a positive approach to failure because like we were all doing it all like we had no idea what we were doing we're like flying by the seat of our pants we're like <laughs> so burnt out and just like trying our best and working with artists and like there were so many ways in which we failed but we learned so much from it and there was like a lot of artist projects that also were like they didn't turn out the way that they wanted or we had to postpone the opening for like the next week because the artwork wasn't ready or you know there was just so many um so many aspects of having a space and artists putting on a show for the first time that it was um just a place that it was okay like it was okay to fuck up and it was okay to to fail um and through that, I think it was really an opportunity to learn more about like, yeah, how how to do any of it, how to put on a show, how to spackle a wall, mm -hmm. how to curate paintings. Like it, it was just an exercise in all of that. So I think that was like super important for us too, that it was a place that was not precious. It was a place that we could just like do what we could and try and have fun while we were doing it. So um yeah, just also wanted to mention that too. Mm, yeah, <laughs> that is so beautiful. <laughs> that is, so, that beautiful. is so beautiful and so important contribution and offering to the city for early emerging artists to be able to to fail. I think just like hearing you talk about that, I I mean, I've witnessed a lot of spaces in the city that everything feels like the stakes are very high mm -hmm. and you're only as good as your last show. And if it goes bad or if it's written about poorly or, you know, and then it's, it's going to make or break your career type, everything feels really rigid and scary. And especially for people who are new to the to the space and to be able to um, to get started in a space that care is centered. I mean, that's that's what I'm hearing as you're talking about it is the care. Um, and I didn't know that you weren't funded. I did not know that. That is, that is so insane yeah. <laughs> and incredible, and and makes me so sad at the same time. Like, I don't know. I just yeah. Where does money go? Like these beautiful spaces that enrich and nourish, and are spaces that we can care for each other and uplift each other and fail together. And that's like really what it's all about. Yeah, um, totally. And to, and I mean that's a whole conversation of like you know where who's supported and and money and whatever. But anyway, I just wanted to add that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Thank you. Uh, I think for us and for me especially, I really had an emphasis that we weren't funded because I didn't want to be bound to any body. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, we really didn't want to have to you know, just get into the whole rigmarole of being funded and then existing purely for the funding. Mm -hmm. um, we were doing it because we wanted to and not because we had to or we had any financial obligation to. And it existed for that period of time. And, you know, now we don't have the space anymore. And um, but that was like the beauty of it was that we were able to do that and it served us and it was able to um, most importantly serve like the early emerging artists that we were working with. But then, yeah, it's, it's fleeting. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not precious, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's something that we could let go. Mm. I mean, I'm curious and maybe this is something we talk about now or later. Okay. Well, I'm just curious about the, the conversations that were had to, to stop doing it or to dissolve or, I don't know. I'm I'm curious a little bit to hear about and whether you feel comfortable or you even want to talk about that, you know, that's up to you because I mean you mentioned burnout and like I think that it's so difficult to walk away from things that are precious and important and blood, sweat and tears have been put into it and then also prioritize the self and your physical well-being that is 
just important as well. And like that conversation, how did it how did it go? How did it feel? It was emotional, I'm sure. <laughs> but I don't know if that's yeah, if you, you feel comfortable about, going you don't into have that. To. Yeah, I mean, I can speak a little bit about mm-hmm. that because honestly, I think it's still maybe even a conversation that needs to be had mm. or it's been partially had or it's mm. been understood, but maybe not fully um, resolved. But essentially, it boils down to the fact that we are all um, getting older and getting different experiences and are prioritizing different parts of ourselves and our practices and um, people move away. Jack Kenne, one of my best friends, he's left the city. You know, other friends, they just move on to different projects. And the thing is that because Ground Floor existed for early emerging artists and we were so in tune with that community, once we start progressing in our own careers and our own practices, like the question is how in tune are we with that anymore? Mm. And, you know, Jack's, for example, gone on to be represented by a gallery. Other friends maybe aren't so involved with the arts anymore. Like for me, I've sort of taken on different roles at other galleries. And um, yeah, I think that the integral part of Ground Floor is supporting early emerging artists. And if we can no longer connect as easily with that community, that means that we aren't the appropriate ones to be doing that work anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that was like a really tough thing to face and to recognize, but something that we always knew was gonna be the case as we like progress forward in our careers and our practices. But yeah, that's basically, yeah, why. And that's such a difficult decision to come to terms with because as you mentioned, it started from a place of love and of care and of community. So I imagine it's really hard to walk away from it. But as you mentioned before, it's it's meant to be something that isn't super precious, like fleeting. And I think that had opened up many doors for a lot of early emerging artists. But also it is important to prioritize yourself and think about where you want to go. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Absolutely. Mm. I think there's something to say about being able to end something when the time is right and to be able to walk away. And that is an okay thing and an acceptable thing. And you've displayed this model and way of being to a space and community Mm -hmm. and that people have seen that and that can be picked up by other people, you know, like Mm -hmm. that's totally, it's not just something you provided for the space here, but uh, it's an example This is how something can be done. And there's a lot of doers Mm -hmm. (laughs) out there. And um, yeah. And there was a point that we hoped that we would be able to like pass along, Mm. you know, ground floor. But the thing is that there's there's nobody that will that will love it and care Mm. for it the same way that. Yeah. That you did. Um, And in that regard. Like, I would hope if anybody ever did want to start something and had any questions about, like, how do you even begin with trying to organize, like, this sort of art collective or art space, I would hope that, yeah, anybody would feel comfortable to reach out and ask me or any member of Ground Floor. I'm sure we would be so happy to answer any questions or anything. Um but yeah, when it's your baby, it's like, no, <laughs> yeah. everyone's got to have their own baby, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then when it's time to let it go, <laughs> away you it goes. send it to preschool. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And also another thing about ground floor ending has to do with COVID as well. Yeah. Maybe we could we can circle over to there just, you know, with COVID hitting uh-huh. the pandemic and it really did a huge number to a lot of DIY spaces um, when people couldn't gather anymore. And yeah, can you speak on how you navigated that period of uncertainty? Yeah, totally. So at that time, right before COVID hit, we actually were preparing to move and renovate a whole new space. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we had been working really hard. We had gotten like a lawyer 
And like we had been doing like asbestos tests in the space. We were like going over a lease and trying to sign a lease, negotiating terms with the landlord. Um, and we, we were just about to sign the lease when the landlord told us that what they told us about the zoning was incorrect. So it was zoned for residential and not for industrial. What the hell? Oh my God. <laughs> and so all the work that we had ever done, like trying to make this move happen, just sort of fell through the cracks of our fingers. That's a huge oversight. What? Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, and the worst timing too, because at that point you can't really start looking for other spaces, right? Well, the thing is that actually was perfect timing yeah. mm, because true. then COVID hit mm -hmm. and we and didn't, then you would have had a space and we would have had a space true. and we would have had to like pay for the rent and to lease the space and renovate it during COVID at a time that was so uncertain. It was mm -hmm. actually like a blessing in disguise because we weren't on the hook. We had given up our old space. We had taken our names off the lease of our old space. And at that time we weren't, we were no longer financially tied to renting any space. So in the end it was actually good for us, but it did sort of put the nail in the coffin. Yeah, for ground floor having a space again. Um, but I did also want to mention that um, the model of ground floor is not um, the first to be seen and that um, I totally um, recognize that ground floor, like it exists because of spaces before it that mm -hmm. had done things like ground floor, spaces like duplex, artist society, spaces like dynamo, those spaces that were studio run and then had gallery space they paved the way for places like ground floor to exist. And that sort of model is really like the only reason why any early emerging artists were able to like have any shows in the city. And so ground floor definitely is, you know, the little sibling of these spaces um, that existed because of a reaction to artist-run centers being unable to access artist-run centers. And artist-run centers, you know, exist out of reaction to not being able to have access to, like, larger institutions. So it's like this trickle-down thing where it's, like, larger institutions, like, yeah, the Vancouver Art Gallery is obviously an impossible place to think of, like, being able to exhibit so, you know, artist-run centers exist as a place to support local artists. And then when that place feels even unattainable, that's when these sort of DIY art collectives and um, spaces start emerging. So, yeah. Anyways, just wanted to give that shout out. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I've been to a few events at Ground Floor before and was actually programmed once through our friends Calvin Valco. And for me, I definitely remember it as such a special space for community that you held there. And definitely the pandemic really shifted the scene in Vancouver, totally. losing so many of these spaces and seeing them uh, change in form. But I just wanted to recognize that space and the work that you all did for emerging artists in Vancouver through the projects you put on, but also through your programming. And we talked a little bit about these barriers that artists, early emerging artists face with artists and centers and more traditional galleries. And I know you've done some programming with early emerging artists, such as with the Wedge Residency at the Contemporary Art Gallery. And I just wanted to ask if you wanted to expand on that and how that was as an experience facilitating early emerging artists in collaboration with a more traditional institution. Yeah, for sure. So Wedge Residency started in 2021 as an unlikely pair, <laughs> ground floor <laughs> with uh, the Contemporary Art Gallery, a very established and old institution in Vancouver. Yeah, we were asked by the CAG to do this project with them, which was huge for us. I mean, to work with a large institution and to get the acknowledgement that like, oh, there is, you know, investment in supporting early emerging artists in the city, not just by us, but hopefully by, you know, larger institutions that previously felt impenetrable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was really important for us to sort of think about this you know, these two sides, like one being a very DIY art collective 
working with an uh, institution that historically supported um, established mid-career and late-career artists. So, yeah, I think the priority for us was this idea of dismantling, like, gatekeeping practices in the city and being able to build connections between different artists in the city and um, cultural workers and, yeah, bringing these two sides of the spectrum together. Yeah, the first year that we did Wedge, we were able to have it in the little back uh, corner space of the gallery. We call that the North Gallery. (laughs) (laughs) It's a ridiculous name. (laughs) Um, And yeah, we were able to provide the space for these artists because it was COVID Mm -hmm. and the space wasn't being utilized. So um, we were able to go through a jurying process and allocate the studio space to a number of artists to utilize and then have them create some sort of public facing output that was facilitated by the CAG. In the second year, it was more of a research-based residency because the CAG was utilizing the space again, so we had to make it a digital residency. So it was more centered around research practices. But yeah, it, I think for us, especially throughout the entire process, we wanted artists to be able to have access to talk to people who are curators in the community or people that have had years of experience or artists that have influenced, you know, these early emerging artists in their practices. Like, I think it was just a great way to sort of start to introduce new people and truly like build connections within the community that could potentially lead to other sorts of outcomes and in our second year especially we really prioritized the idea of mentorship and having artists choose people that they wanted to work with and do studio visits with and support them throughout their practice in the ways that they needed it whether that be in research or a more material way but yeah it was really great to to see all these residents um, come out of the program because then we saw, you know, the next year, like the residents, you know, doing residencies at like Deer Lake or James Black Gallery or Burrard Arts Foundation or Griffin Art Projects or Artspeak and, you know, so many other places. And that's the same with Ground Floor too, like as a space that people had their first shows, like to now see those artists get, nominated for the Sobe, for example, like is pretty crazy. Like, it, and I feel like, so I, I just feel so happy that we were able to like provide that space for artists to be able to really explore and have time and uh, resources to dedicate to their practices. So yeah, I felt very grateful for, for the entire experience. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that and it's so great to hear about you know we talked about covid um and how the pandemic has really shifted things but also it's beautiful to hear how those it's bittersweet but how the pandemic had also opened up an opportunity for you to do programming in ways that weren't available before yeah and i guess just shifting gears a little bit uh talking about access and who gets to hold knowledge, I wanted to ask you, Vito, because having gone to school together, and I I talk about that all the time, um, I was very privileged to see how your practice and the focus of your work has shifted and evolved over time. And one of your main priorities is access and looking at how knowledge is kept in the archive or anti-archive, as you call it, But yeah, I guess I wanted to ask you about expanding on your practice and how those modes of thinking have influenced your work. Mm, Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think. So thinking about archives and anti-archive, when we were in school together, uh, I think the second half of art school, third and fourth year, I was really starting to reckon with the fact, whether I knew it sort of consciously or not, that I was disabled <laughs> and um, and I wasn't really feeling supported by the school in that 
and my profs um, in that. And I mean, they have supported me in other ways. And so I want to just preface with that. Um, that being said, um, I started to work with paper and and texts. And in short, I would collect texts, primarily academic texts, uh, and blend them up and make paper out of them and then give them as my projects back to the profs. I saw that as sort of a humorous sort of pushback to my educational experience. Um, I thought if you aren't going to support me, um, I'm going to take the thing that legitimizes this space, and that is academic text and high barrier language, and I'm going to rip that up into little shreds, and I'm going to make it illegible, and I'm going to make it, um, I'm just going to break it down, and I'm going to give it back to you, and you're going to give me a grade. And I think that started this sort of uh, reckoning for myself of how I saw myself as a learner within that space, and it felt sort of, I don't know, it was an exploration. This process of collecting these texts, uh, blending them down, mixing them with like other things, other types of texts, like my diary, who calls them diary, my journal, my bullet journal, or shopping lists, or books that I love, or uh, recipes. Just I was thinking about knowledge and ways to take different things that I knew and put them together because I think, you know, institutional and university learning, everything's really in a box. You know, you mm -hmm. have the biology department and visual art and everything. It's built um, for things to exist in containers. And that is, you know, Western knowledge. We see something, we put it in a box. That's how we understand it. It's there. Other things are, you know, it's all sort of fragmented. And so I guess, yeah, my Early practice is really thinking about ways of breaking down those barriers, mushing everything together, and then making them inaccessible to everybody. <laughs> um, I don't think that's necessarily the solution to knowledge. I think a lot of it was really satirical because I think inaccessible in itself, like knowledge that's not accessible in itself, that's, I don't think that my work is like particularly speaking to that in a helpful way but I guess just in a comedic way I was just like I'm doing this <laughs> I'm doing this thing and I would later find out that I am autistic so that also <laughs> there was just a lot of the like sort of self sort of labels that uh, came up from that time and and discovery and this was a beginning of me starting to think about access and what that means for me as a student later to be me as an artist, later to be me as a cultural worker. Uh, I think it really all started in those last two years, um, whether, yeah, like I said, I realized or not, I can now look back and sort of trace this through line of realizing I wasn't supported or I didn't feel supported. I didn't feel like I had, um, I mean, there was the center of accessible learning that SFU had that I was registered in, but I found out that Sometimes my profs would receive them and just not read them or um, I would ask for certain accommodations and be met with resistance or as if I was slacking off when that wasn't the case. Um, I wanted to drop out in second year because I was like, I can't do this without medication. So those early years really taught me how to self-advocate, which I think is a skill that really has translated to where I am now. Did I answer your question? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, that's actually a great segue into my second question for you, which mm. is about your community practice. Mm. So obviously your artistic practice and your community practice is very much overlapping. Mm. Can you elaborate more on that, um, such as the workshops that you facilitated and also your work on the Grant Gallery Board? Mm. Totally. Yeah, I think over the past year and a half, two years, I've really done a lot of learning it really kind of started or the catalyst of this trajectory in my professional life or in my work at galleries started when I attended a series of workshops uh, with artist Carmen Papelia and it was called Beyond the Checklist um, I learned a lot about what it means to be disabled in the arts a lot of language. It was just a, a major download and awakening for me 
um, that really grounded me for months and I know years to come because I realized that I have an opportunity to overlap, to advocate the way that I did for myself at school, but in these art spaces, I mean... Yeah, and that has looked sort of a, a number of ways. You talked about workshops, and one of the things I do at CAG is uh, facilitate these workshops called Open Studio, um, where I work with emerging artists uh, in the city and have them respond to a show and do a, sort of a hands-on art-making activity for the public. And one of the seasons um, previously, or recently, I should say, I was the artist instead of the facilitator. Uh, I was in a unique position where I could respond to the gallery because I was the studio assistant for the artist showing who is Kathy Slade. And so I realized that I had an opportunity to create a space um, in a, you know, a, a gallery that I worked at, resources I was very familiar with, spaces that I was really familiar with, and I was able to do my own thing. And I think that sort of set the tone for realizing I have agency in this space. <laughs> I am able to do things that are made for my brain, um, that are considering other people's sort of access needs really intentionally. And so I did this low sensory workshop that was about photage and we would uh, we learned about sort of photage as an art technique but I did the lights and I added dampers on all of them and I had a carpet and these like lamps everywhere <laughs> and I, you know encourage people to bring headphones if they wanted to I bought all these stim toys for everybody because I was thinking um, how can I make this space accessible for myself um, and starting there and then I think that's a big thing that's yeah how it started like how can I make these spaces feel good for me therefore hopefully good for other people um, who have maybe similar brains as me or who also have sort of sensory needs and yeah I think that I learned a lot through that workshop and it really excited me because I thought I, I realized like this is something I can do in other places and that they're meaningful and I got really nice feedback from them as well that leads to sort of my work with Grunt. So I, the sort of initial download happened when I got to attend those workshops with Carmen. Um, and then I got put in contact with Grunt Gallery and worked with Kay Slater and Kimi Nakashima Showa, both of them who are doing really, I think people would like to call it radical, but it's, I think, really basic <laughs> or like um, should be standard sort of accessibility practices in their programming. Um, and working with them and being mentored by both of them has really shaped the way that I approach my work, both like the day to day at CAG and the office upstairs and also my approach to hosting people um, and the emerging artists that I work with for Open Studio. Yeah, so that led to me being a uh, board member, which really was amazing because Obviously, I had a lot of the context of how I thought things were run in the city came from CAG and places similar to CAG and to witness the way that things are run in Grunt. Obviously, they're very different spaces and not everywhere can be Grunt and that's okay also. But I really was moved and enriched and um, delighted by how much they center care and the work that they do and how that really starts with the care of the staff and the care of each other. Because I think when you care for the person next to you, <laughs> um, it makes, you know, trust happen or a certain level of trust. It doesn't mean that like your workplace is your family, because I feel like some boundaries there are also important. But um, when you do trust your workplace to a certain extent, that makes all the difference. So, Yeah. Another workshop I did was also for low sensory makers through the Audain SFU galleries. Um, I co-ran actually with Kami and we did together and it was for low sensory makers. And again, I was thinking about how can I make this space um, accessible and interesting and exciting for myself. And at the time I was like super into uh, playing Stardew Valley um, on my Switch, yes. which is portable. Um, and I was like, let's have this workshop be centered around people's special interests or hobbies um, and how can we lean into 
things that don't necessarily make us money or things that are sort of aesthetically pleasing and and come together and do things that bring us joy within these spaces that are really aesthetics first like you know into it wasn't inside a gallery but it was associated um how can we bring joy <laughs> into these spaces i think that was a, sort of the first iteration of me thinking about joy at galleries and softness and care um and so we invited people to bring whatever sort of hobby they were doing knitting games painting drawing etc um and that yeah that started this Or it was just a continuation of this exploration that I've been having as a facilitator. And it has now reached the third level (laughs) where I have the opportunity. Uh, Kimi and Kay have reached out to me to work on two workshops with them uh, at Grunt Gallery around STEM toys and how we can see STEM toys as companions (laughs) and how we can see stimming um, in the office as these like important acts of resistance within these spaces. Because I I remember when I started working in an office feeling like I had to really filter myself and sort of mask really heavily and um, yeah, a lot of filtering happened and I've been sort of easing out of that. And this workshop is going to be for other cultural workers. And the goal is to A, explore what stimming is. Um, everybody stims. It's not just something that like neurodivergent people do or autistic people do. Like it is everybody. Like if you dance when you're happy, that's stimming. If you, you know, bite your nails, that's to mean playing with your hair, like these releases, these very human and bodily things that we do to release anxiety or to self-soothe or self-regulate are all very human and normal and important things. And so the workshop is going to introduce that as an offering for other cultural workers um, to lean into that. We're also going to make little toys that they can bring to work or give to a friend or whatever and talk about this yeah the the history of stimming or the history of the stress ball is what I'm gonna I think center because everyone knows what a stress ball is and um yeah I'm really finding this sort of I want to say niche but it's it's not I'm trying not to be like this is just a small little fragment in this community that exists like this is something that everybody does and I guess I'm just trying to like um carve out a a space where we can just like name it and relax and be human and care for each other so it's really exciting I feel comforted in this sort of trajectory that I've been on this path that I've been on I feel really supported by grunt and paying me to do work like this it feels kind of on one hand part of my brain is like this is so silly like they are giving me you know Canadian dollars to talk about play but at the same time it's okay it's canadian dollars (laughs) that's right if it was usd then they'd be out of their mind (laughs) no kidding um but that they are centering these experiences and backing them and offering them to the community and i'm i'm not trying to show up as an expert at all i'm trying to learn with others i'm trying to talk about these experiences that we all have and navigate this field that is very cold. Oh, there's people there's clapping. People that's a type of stim. They're <laughs> clapping. Um, that's perfect. Yeah, I feel really excited and, and honored and privileged to be able to have this opportunity to do this thing that interests me and I hope will maybe leave a little impact to other people that work in um, spaces and that we can co-learn and share and um acknowledge that these spaces are difficult and also we can experience joy within them that is an act of resistance and resilience and it's important so yeah thank you that's beautiful um thank you for sharing both of you your experience and your work and I am hearing a lot centers around care and joy and I think that is so beautiful and something that we should focus on more honestly Yeah, both of you have done work that helps platform emerging artists or find ways of accessing art outside of the traditional institution. I guess I just wanted to expand on that and also talk about how you bring accessibility into the institutional world. Yeah, 
I think that a lot of things that institutions will face and people who are experienced any sort of marginalization um, who work in this field, I think there's a big surge of EDI work happening uh, over the past few years. And I think what I hope to see and am working towards myself and like the ways that I'm inviting people into the space, like where possible, who am I inviting into the space and what opportunities can I provide them and payment can I provide them? What I've been, um, and again, things I've learned from Grunt and from Carmen and from other sort of leaders that work in disability justice in Vancouver is what can I bring to other spaces that I've learned and sort of model these practices? So I think an example is today when we all did visual descriptions Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about ways that we can bring these small things that we learn into other spaces that sort of accessibility doesn't have to be this. um, I mean, deep change is necessary, but what are small things that we can bring into spaces that model more accessible ways of being? And so Things like image descriptions, alt text, descriptive audio guides, transcripts, captions. We just had a show open at the gallery and um, there was no captions on it. And so I had a conversation with the curator. I'm like, you know, this would be great if we could do that and let's do that. And so we made it happen and now we have captions and that makes the world of the difference of who can access this type of art and Yeah, I think small things like that has been something that I've been leaning into and makes a really big difference. And I also think when you add things, those sort of accessible points, it also softens up a gallery. Like this isn't just a space for people who have great vision and that are hearing and that are of a certain class or whatever. Like this is for people, we have multilingual audio guides, like accessibility is not just for English speakers or, you know, like these different things that a space can do to make the gallery feel more inviting and welcoming and that this is not just for a certain group of people. That's both like on a structural level or like in a programming way, but also in marketing and online. So yeah, I've done a lot of learning of like what that looks like over the past year and I'm excited to continue learning. But um, yeah, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. And do you have any advice for emerging artists or those who are coming out of art school? Um, I mean, yeah, I feel like it is such a daunting experience to try and navigate like the art community in Vancouver and art community in general. Mm -hmm. I feel like now more than ever, we should be supporting the emerging artists and initiatives that are happening and a lot of people don't know where to start so I think my advice is just to be present if you can like go to openings go to workshops attend free events go to performances maybe like connect with the people that are around because people are interested in chatting and making connections with like new folks. That was like the beautiful thing about Ground Floors because I got to meet so many artists and those people came to be the most significant people in my life. And I think in particular, like a lot of opportunities came about because we were really actively trying to just be a physical presence and assert ourselves as human beings that exist in the community in the space. And I think another huge thing for me was finding people that will be able to provide those little access points and be able to um, give you resources or like help you edit, you know, a grant or something like that. Because I, I think people are really hesitant to ask for help or maybe hesitant to ask for resources But a lot of the time, people want to be able to share that knowledge. And I want to be able to share that knowledge and provide that to people who want to be able to further their practices. So, yeah, to reiterate again, if anybody wanted some advice, like I, of course, would be more than happy to, you know, share those those resources that I do have or know about in the city and Yeah, like with the ground floor wedge applications, we made sure that we had a list of resources, like places to look for grants, whether it be with the 
British Columbia Arts Council or the Canada Council or even Vancouver Small Community Projects and stuff like that. You know, there are little pockets of money that you can find or different residencies that you can apply for that can always help get your foot in the door. So I think really just being present and asking for help or trying to make connections with people really goes a long way. Thank you. I'm making a little heart, a hand heart. <laughs> um, I, maybe I would say ditto. ditto. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Okay. And just another general question, uh, opening it up to you folks. Do you have any upcoming projects or anything that you're working on that excites you or that you want to share? Like personal projects, personal curatorial work, upcoming shows at a gallery? Foot pointed. It, it was. I know. Um, okay, sure, I can start. I mean, the most recent thing or the most mm -hmm. upcoming thing is this workshop that I'm uh, hosting with Grunt. It is a two-part workshop. So part one will be for cultural workers um, and thinking about reimagining office spaces um, to center care and joy um, and stimming and learning about that. But then there's going to be a part two in the new year for the public. So you can look out for that. And um, it's going to be similar vibes, just not so centered around office culture, but day to day, stimming in the day to day and, and joy, et cetera, um, and care. And I'm really excited for that. And uh, yeah, next year, I mean, August of next year, I have a duo show at Artspeak um, <laughs> with uh, artist Lan Florency, um, who's a Toronto-based artist who I'm really excited to show with. Um, and that's being curated by uh, the Dirty Dishes Collective that are based in um, Victoria. And yeah, that's going to be really cool. Uh, look out for that. Woo. <laughs> Yeah, I guess um, the one upcoming project that I'm excited to share is next year I will be curating a project at the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Garden mm -hmm. uh, in both the public and the private park. Um, it's the theme of the exhibition is about the contemporary condition of love. Mm -hmm. And I am working with Kat from Unit Pit. It will be part of Unit Pit's programming hosted by the garden. And so I'm really excited for that. Um, it'll be work that's all in the garden. Mm. So you can navigate the garden and walk through it and encounter artworks. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm working on. And then apart from that, I've been playing Zelda. <gasps> so. Me too. Hell Tears of the yeah. Kingdom? Yeah. Stop it. Every fucking night of my life I'm playing that. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my god, how far are you in? Oh, I just started. Oh my god. I'm this is excited. my first Zelda game ever. What? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Well, I am so excited for you. I love you're, it. You're, you're about to strap in for a wild ride. I think I've played over 100 hours now. Oh, <laughs> To be honest and vulnerable I, with you, I, I am nowhere that. near the end. I nowhere near. That. I get so distracted. I'm like, oh, a plant here. Oh, a monster there. Yes, I'm gonna. I'm going for a walk. Yes. <laughs> wow. I feel so left out now. You've been trying to get me on Zelda yeah. for a bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you got it. That's you got it. So get epic. Ooh, okay. You just like really talked to my heart. There was like, I was not expecting that. Our oh next interview, we will reconvene and we'll just talk about Zelda because yes. I'll be on. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh my god. Check. <laughs> that's so epic. Oh, that's so that's so exciting. Like both both projects and also personal Zelda endeavors. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a lot to do in that world. I am booked and busy. Let me tell you, <laughs> I am. <laughs> oh, amazing. Okay, is there anything that you would like to add or? Yeah, thank you so much for sharing today and all the vulnerability and also knowledge that you're that you're sharing with everybody, with all our listeners. Thank you so much for having me and yeah, for having this conversation, Vito. Mm. It's been so nice mm. to hear more about your projects yeah. and yeah, super excited for this workshop. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you, everybody. <laughs> it's been nice. I 
appreciate opportunities to have sort of like loose and flowing conversations like this and yeah and to share space and to be able to share these experiences it's cool it's special and it's important thank you so much Below the Radar is the Knowledge Democracy podcast created by SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. Thanks for listening to our episode with Aisha Zhang and Victoria Montero. Head to the show notes to learn more about their work and to keep up to date with their upcoming projects. Tune in next week for another episode of our See How We Run mini series. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on your podcast listening app of choice, and we'll catch you next time on Below the Radar. <laughs>